Today we're going on an imaginary field trip to see how data is processed and stored inside your computer's memory. Computer science, the golden arena of endless well-paying jobs, needs problem solvers from all backgrounds, but appears surrounded by a thick wall of incomprehensible ones and zeros, self-righteous nerd minions, and endless differential equation nightmares. This video textbook attempts to create an entrance through that wall by teaching programming basics in the language of real people. This video is a lecture covering programming tools and methods. To watch a real-life example in three different coding languages, click here. And to listen to this chapter's lecture on computer science beyond programming, click here. Last week we talked about what data is and how your computer uses binary to store it. Today we're going to look at a more useful level at how data goes from a programmer's mind to a computer's memory. As with a lot of computer science topics, we can't actually see the tangible physical process of storing data. The state machines we talked about last week are so microscopic and so fast that trying to watch them work is difficult. We really can only see the results by displaying them to a screen. Because of this, nerds tend to talk about memory as an abstract and almost intangible topic. And that works for students who are good at following abstract and intangible topics. But normal people don't generally learn that way. We tend to learn by making things more tangible. So let's do that today with a little imagination. I hope none of you get motion sickness. Let's pretend that the memory of your computer, remember that's the place where data is stored for quick short-term access, we're going to pretend it's a big distribution warehouse. Let's take a tour of what memory looks like to most programming languages. Kids, this is your computer's memory warehouse. And to help us around today, here's our imaginary tour guide, Zor Gates. Hi Zor! Hey everyone, and welcome to our memory warehouse. This is where almost all the data that passes from you to your computer is stored until it's ready to be processed. It's a lot like a distribution center for shipping packages. So Zor, when someone sends you data, what do you do with it first? Well, we won't accept any data unless it's packed into an appropriate container. That makes it easy for us to store, process, and retrieve later. So how's that work? Well, people can either use our standard containers, or they can make their own. But they have to be one of two styles. The first style of container is called a variable. That sounds like a math term I know. Why is it called that? Well, it did start out as a math term, but it really doesn't work like math variables do. In fact, it might be just easiest to think about it this way. We call these boxes variables because people can come back and change what's inside them. So the content can vary a little. Okay, so that makes sense. You call it a variable because it lets the data be changed. Or in other words, the data inside can be varied. That's right. And that makes a lot more sense when you see the next style of box. These are constants. Wait, 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 let me guess. They're called constants because the data inside can't be changed? So it stays constant? You got it. If anyone tries to change the data in these constant styled boxes, they're going to get an error message and their program won't work. Why wouldn't you want to be able to change the data? That's a good question. Sometimes data isn't meant to be changed. For example, the data of the 1964 Olympics opening ceremony doesn't ever change. Oh, I guess that doesn't. A decimal approximation of pi doesn't change. It will always be 3.14. Well, I guess that's true. So people have to know if data is going to change or not before they decide what style of box they want. Yes, exactly. So are all the boxes one size fits all? Oh no, not at all. Different kinds of data need different boxes. A lot of languages nowadays like to pick out boxes for you. But you should learn the process so you know if they mess up. So you first choose the style. Variable or constant? Yeah, and then you choose the type. Now each programming language might have a few different types, but generally speaking, they will have these in some form. The first one we call an integer, or int for short. It holds whole numbers. So numbers without a decimal point. Exactly. By getting rid of the decimal point, we can make the box a lot smaller. So we don't need as much space in memory. Well, and I can think of lots of reasons why you wouldn't want a decimal point like a phone number, a date, an invoice. Exactly. So can it hold any hold number? No, and that's because it's meant to be a small box. We want to make sure it will fit on the shelf, so we have to limit how big a number you can store in the int. How big can it be? That really depends on your programming language. Most languages find that four bytes is the most efficient size. So that gives you a range of negative 2,147,483,648 to a 2,147,000,000 47. Wow, that was quite impressive. It's good to be aware of, I guess. So four bytes, you say? Correct me if I'm wrong, but that is, let's see, four times eight equals... 32 bits? That's 32 little state machines turning off and on just to store a whole number? For most languages. Wow. Even if it's just the number one? I mean, one can be represented with just one bit, right? 
That's true, but to manage our shelves in a standard way, things have to be in a standard box of some kind. As long as the data fits in a box, it doesn't matter the amount of data inside, it's the box size that we care about. Wow, well that's good to know. What about decimals? We have boxes for those too. A lot of languages have a box called a float. It's the same size as an int, but your range is entirely different because now you have a decimal to represent. If you need more space than that, the next size up is called a double. Is that because it's double the size? Yeah, it takes up 8 bytes on the shelf. I see, 8 bytes. That's 64 little state machine bits. <laughs> Again, in most languages. Some languages only give you one option to store numbers. They just have a numbers box, and any number you send them goes into that box. Well, that does sound easier. Yeah, but it uses even more room, and it, it's harder to make a language do that. So it's really only the more modern languages that handle it that way. So what about data that isn't a number? Like, maybe a letter? Yeah. Most languages have a box type called a character, or a char for short. And depending on the language and encoding, that could be one or two bytes. Wait, what do you mean by encoding? Well, when they first created binary alphabets, each country had their own, and they only worried about the letters and punctuation their language used, so they didn't need very much space. Later, as computers became a worldwide affair, they had to come up with a new binary alphabet that had space for all the other characters from all the other languages. And you call those alphabets encoding? Yes. Want to see another box? This is our smallest box. It's generally just one bit. Its name is a boolean, or bool for short. I know about booleans. They're named after the guy who pretty much invented binary math, aren't they? At least something like that. We'll have a lesson on this at some point, I think. As I was saying, bools can be so small, but so useful, because they answer the most important questions. Yes or no. So they just store a yes or a no? Actually, they store true or false. An example might be useful. So, if you knew people were going to use your program to find out if there's ice cream in the fridge, you could tell us down here in memory. Let's say that there is ice cream in the fridge. Now, we'll take the data and store it as a 1 in binary for true. There is ice cream in the fridge. We'll name your box the question people would ask to find your data. For example, we'll name your box, is there ice cream in the fridge? And anytime someone asks, we can look up that box by its name and tell them if it's true or false. So it's kind of like the button you push to let the airline stewardess know that you need help. On, you need help. Off, you just want to be left alone? Exactly. In fact, you can represent anything with two different states in one bit as long as you name it well. So wait, what do you mean by that? Well, when you bring data to us, you'll let us know what kind of box you want and what you want to name it. Then, we will hand it to one of our shelf stalkers. They'll go search for a spot to put it. When they find a spot, they'll record the coordinates of that location. The name is the way you want to look it up when you want to retrieve the data. We'll keep a table of all the names we've assigned and then put the coordinates of where they are on the shelf right next to the name. Those coordinates are called the memory address. So every time I store data, I'm not only storing the data, but also its name and its address? Mm-hmm. That's how we know how to get your stuff when you want it. That's a lot to store. It is, but modern computers have enough memory that storing all that extra data isn't a big deal. Now, there is one more type of box I want to show you before we move on. It's a string. It's a list of characters in a line. Every coding language has some form of it, and they each are a little different. However, to you, they will basically look like the same kind of box. So how big is it? That's the crazy thing about strings. They don't have a defined size. What do you mean? Well, this is how most coding languages make strings. The string goes to memory one character at a time. We put the first character into the smallest box we can find. Then if another one comes, we'll have a worker find a box twice as big and a slot on the memory shelves to store it. Then if another one comes along, we'll look for another box twice the size of that one. Every time the string gets too big for its box, we double the box size. It sounds like a lot of extra work, but since we don't want to limit the size of the text and we don't want to waste space on our shelf, it's actually one of the best methods we have. Wow, strings sound expensive memory-wise. Maybe more than a lot of the boxes we've talked about today, but not as much as the ones we're about to talk about. Well, before moving on, I want to clarify that all of these boxes can work both as constants and variables, correct? Yes, generally speaking, all these we've just talked about can be done as a constant or a variable. Does that mean that some boxes can't? Actually, it just means that some boxes can get a little complicated. It might be best to talk about it when everyone understands programming more. All right, I can deal with that. What's our next box? There are a lot more boxes to talk about, and we may never be able to cover them all, but the next one is important. Unfortunately, your students won't understand much about it till later in the course, so we're just going to talk about it briefly. Our last box is an object. It's a very advanced box that contains lots of little boxes. It's far more powerful than this, but for an example, you might have an object built like a person. It could have a variable int box for the age of the person, a string for the name, a float for the height, a bool for whether they're alive or not, 
or any other data you want to keep about them. And it's not just groups of boxes either. They can have operators processing that data too. There is so much to talk about with objects, but that should be enough for now. Well, that sounds good to me. But tell the class what an operator is now that you've brought it up. Oh, operators are great. They're a tiny little program that processes data for you. For example, this operator is the additions operator. It will add two numbers or concatenate two strings. And it can do some other crazy things if you want to play around with it. This is the subtraction operator. It will subtract the first number from the second. This is the multiplication operator. And here's the division operator. Let me guess, this is the equal operator? Nope. Good guess, though. This is the assignment operator. This is the tiny little program that sends and changes the data you store in memory. What? Yeah, depending on what language you're using, the paperwork on the left-hand side may be different, but whatever is on the right-hand side will be stored in memory under the name you gave it in your paperwork. Wow, so if I try to use it to find out if things are equal... You'll most likely ruin your data. Good to know. So is there an equal operator? Yes, it's this. There's also a congruent operator in some languages, and a lot of other operators. You'll be able to learn more about them along the way. It sounds like operators process data differently depending on what type of box it's in. Yeah, in fact, that's one of the biggest reasons that we require data to be put in boxes. For example, the string boxes with the addition operator in between them will get smushed together. The int boxes with an addition operator between them will get added like numbers. If you tell us to store the numbers 1 and 2 in string boxes, and then you try to add them, you'll get the string 12. If you tell us to put them in int boxes and add them, you'll get three. Wow, so choosing the right box for what you want to do really does matter. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you for your time, Zor. My pleasure. So some of those terms, like boxes or styles, you won't actually hear nerds talk about. They were just ways of relating some hard-to-understand concepts to something easy to understand. However, you will hear a lot of the terms like bool, int, variable, constant, over and over again. You'll soon become very comfortable with all these terms. I also want to thank Adam from AMF Productions for bringing Zor to life for us. You can see more of Adam's work here. Your homework assignment is to figure out how to store the data for some real-life object into little constant or variable boxes. Try to store at least five different points of data about that object. Watch us do it in the exercise. We'll show you how to do it in three different coding languages. 